Welcome to the Korea Defense Veterans Association and the Center for Strategic and International Studies Seminar on the continuing commitment to Korea in this beautiful Lincoln Library at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Washington, D.C. So we're very thankful that two organizations that care deeply about the ROK U.S. Alliance and our veterans have teamed up for the first time, one of many, hopefully, to bring this continuing commitment to Korea seminar and reception to raise awareness about the vital role of the United Nations Command and its 17 sending states. These 17 UNC sending states are still committed to supporting South Korea. That's even after 70 years after the signing of the Ar Korean Armistice Agreement in July 27th, 1953. This forum will provide a very unique voice for this little known fact that is so important for the defense and prosperity of Korea. So I am Colonel Retired Steve Lee, the Senior Vice President of KDVA. So before I introduce our opening speakers, I'm just gonna provide some information for you. So this video is live streaming and uh, being recorded and it'll be available on the KDVA digital library and YouTube channel in a couple of days. If you haven't done so already, please silence your smartphones. We have refreshments in the back as you found, so please help yourself throughout. So events like this are possible due to the great fundraising efforts of our partner in Korea, the Korea-US Alliance Foundation or KUSEF. So they're not here to join us. So please let give, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, I would also like to share our condolences on the recent passing of General Robert Senewal at the age of 93. He was the four-star commander in Korea from 1982 to 1984. His funeral service was just held earlier this afternoon at Fort Myer with internment at Arlington National Cemetery. Four former commanders attended the service and they were General Robert Riscasi, General John Tolelli, John, General Walter Sharp, and General Curtis Caparati. The United States and the Republic of Korea lost a great leader and we send our sincere condolences to Mrs. Susan Senewald and their family. So here is the agenda, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we start with welcome remarks by Dr. John Hamry, the CSIS president and CEO, and General Curtis Scaparati, KDVA chairman and president. We will hear a Korea defense veterans perspective about serving with the United Nations Command and the 17 UNC sending states from general retired Vincent Brooks, the former UNC commander, who better to provide that perspective? <laughs> um, then uh, we transition into our panel discussion led by Dr. Victor Cha, CSIS, Senior Vice President for Asia and Korea Chair with a very distinguished panel consisting of former U.S. Ambassador to Korea, Ambassador Mark Lippert, former UNC commander, U.S. General Curtis Scaparati, and then the current Deputy UNC Commander, UK, Lieutenant General Andrew Harrison, who is up at four in the morning joining us from Korea. After the seminar, please join us for a reception directly out the door you came in. You can't miss it. You gotta literally walk through it, get some hors d'oeuvres, some beverages of your choice and enjoy yourself and meet everybody, please. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. John Amory, no stranger to people in this room. He was elected president and CEO of CSIS in January, 2000. Before joining CSIS, he served as the 26th U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense. In 2007, the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, appointed Dr. Hamry to serve as chairman of the Defense Policy Board, and he served in that capacity for four Secretaries of Defense. Dr. Hamry received his PhD with distinction from the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. So please, let's welcome Dr. Hamry. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. You're very kind. I, I always, uh, in my mind, felt sorry for whoever was the warm up act for Jay Leno. That's what I'm doing for Mike Scaparati today. I'm just kind of getting the audience ready, you know, for, for Mike. Um, but I did want to say words of uh, thanks and welcome to everybody, and delighted you're all here. Um, you know, there should be a hundred times as many people focusing here today as are because the issue is probably more important now than ever. Uh, I really do admire the Korean Defense 
Veterans Association for keeping a focus on this. This is not enough Americans um, think about this anymore. You know, we have peace in Northeast Asia because we've partnered together to make sure that there was peace in Northeast Asia. And it's you, you keep that flame alive. And I want to say thank you to all of you. <clears throat> I, I, I don't... I don't know who it was that decided on this topic today to talk about the UN command. Um, and I have to just confess my own personal uh, ignorance. I, I, you know, I've heard about it for 40 years, you know, never really spent much time thinking about it, to be candid. And it's only been in the last three, four months that I've really started thinking about it. I'll tell you what caused me to start doing some deeper thinking. And that was, um, as many of you here may know, uh, last, uh, last fall, CSIS, we did a series of war games on what would fighting uh, across the Taiwan Straits be like. And we uh, conducted 24 different war games on that. And um, yes, it's, you know, it's possible to, to blunt an attack, but the price is enormous and it's extraordinary if you think about it. But what I had not appreciated at the time was how it was going to trigger thinking in both Taiwan and in Korea about how a Korea peninsula security environment could be impacted by tension in the Straits. Um, several months back, um, Victor Cha and Ellen Kim, Dr. Ellen Kim had hosted a conference at CSIS where it was the first time we've ever done a trilateral Taiwan, Korea, US trilateral to talk about security. And uh, I was not intellectually prepared for the conversations that I heard because I had not really thought through um, if there was tension uh, over Taiwan, would either opportunistically, would North Korea stir up problems because they think we're distracted? Would China provoke something to try to tie us down in two different venues? Um, you know, when I look back over the 24 war games, you know, that we've, you know, the only way to really get forces there quickly is to take them out of Korea. Okay, well, that obviously sparked some understandable concern about deterrence and what does that do in the region. So I, uh, this is a conference uh, really designed to address my ignorance. And I, I really am going to learn a lot listening to everybody today. In the conversations that I've had since then, um, what, what the UN command comes up and it comes up because it's such a unique thing that we do not have any place else in Asia. And that is the legitimate capacity to create a stronger deterrence structure and make it an international deterrence structure. Um, it, it, but right now, uh, there's been very little focus or tension or understanding about the UN command. What is it that we can do together to start raising the profile so that it adds to the deterrent quality of our, our side, frankly, if we start getting into a tense environment? We have no comparable international framework that we could bring to Taiwan, but we do for Korea. How do we make that meaningful? How do we make that significant? What do we do? And it's a lot more complicated than I had thought. Uh, I've been involved in a number of conversations over the last several months, just kind of digging into this intellectually, and it's complicated. You know, it gets into, um, complicated perceptions of, you know, look, seven of the UN command bases are in Korea. 
well, who's well, who takes the lead on that? You know, is that is that um, Combined Forces Command Korea? Is that Pacific Command? How do the Japanese feel about that? I mean, these are complicated sets of issues that we have to think through. It isn't just, you know, kind of an academic discussion now. It has real tangible meaning. And I hope that we get into that today. I think that's going to be the value for me. I, we're all going to benefit from this. And I just want to say my sincere thanks to the Korean Defense Veterans Association for giving us the opportunity to partner on this. And now I think I've warmed up the audience, I hope, well enough to ask you to welcome with your warm applause, Mike Scaparati. Thank you. Well, that, that was quite a warm up. I don't th I think you're going to be disappointed in the following act. But, uh, sir, listen, it's, it's really a privilege for uh, KDVA to work with CSIS and with you. And we appreciate your presence and, uh, and, and co-sponsoring this with us. We think it is obviously an, an important project, an important topic that needs some, some focus here. Um, we hope to illuminate uh, many of the things that you talked about in the course of either the speakers or the, uh, or the panel itself. Uh, we've got a distinguished audience here. Um, all of them see Korea as important, many of them I know, and we appreciate your attendance today and your concern and support for the Alliance and for all that we do uh, with our ROC allies and with the UNC nations uh, to keep them strong and to ensure that uh, the peninsula remains stable. You know, despite all the challenges around the world, each of them vying for headlines as we look at the news every day, what we see most often and most people I think pay attention to is in fact the Ukraine war, the hot conflict there. And certainly there's focus on the hybrid conflict you might call it with China, but also making a splash pretty regularly is Korea, North Korea. Uh, in the past year, they've fired over 100 missiles. And in fact, one of those just recently was an ICBM that's solid fueled, which reduces our warning and increases their range. So when you look at, think about that, and that although not as often on the front page, it's a place that we all know that overnight can change dramatically in terms of its stability and the crisis that, that it would cause. North Korea is steadily improving their capabilities in nuclear and missile in particular, in size and diversity and lethality. Um, we have to pay attention to that. And we have to ensure that others remain committed to Korea because of that. Now, discussions of deterrence and defense in Korea also, most often, focus on uh, the Combined Forces Command, the ROC US Alliance and those issues. In fact, we just had the recent meeting of the presidents, which met the agreements or made agreements under the Washington Declaration, which I think is tremendous and very, very important with respect to deterrence and defense on the peninsula, but the focus on the alliance. Our purpose here today is to focus on something, some uh, another organization that's important in this day-to-day -day deterrence and defense. And that's the United Nations Command that is there and the 17 sending states that are a part of that. When I arrived as the commander in 2013, I too had studied the UN Command. I'd had briefings on it, but I really didn't appreciate it well until I'd been in the saddle for a little while and had to wrestle with that. And then I began to realize that there was real potential in the UNC command. Now, one of the problems at that time was it was essentially an American command. And all of those commanders were dual-hatted or triple-hatted, in my case and several of the other seniors. Uh, and, and so it was my impression that we needed to leverage that. For instance, right away, those, uh, the ambassadors from those 16 other nations immediately offered their help. 
So much so that we decided, okay, let's revitalize the UNC command. Let's begin to put flesh on the bones of this staff. And we immediately set up meetings with those ambassadors, which they readily came to. So every month we brought in those 16 ambassadors. We kept them informed. And if there was a crisis, we informed them. We even met with them in several times of the crises so that they would know factually everything that we knew and they could inform their nations. And in fact, they did speak out. So Dr. Hamry, just as you said, what we saw the, in the initial part of this and the reason we started the revitalization was that I realized that we had by UNSC mandate, 17 nations already committed on the peninsula and obviously willing to use their diplomatic, economic, and their informational powers in support of what CFC and USFK were doing. So that was the genesis of this. And, and as you'll mention, you're going to hear from General Vince Brooks here shortly, who did a masterful job of, of, of extending UNC, of beginning to put uh, key leaders in place and bringing in those from other sending nations to take those positions. You'll hear from General Harrison, who's now the deputy commander, a UK general officer, to get the most recent reports from him. And uh, with that, and uh, the renowned Victor Chaw leading a panel here with this group and uh, Ambassador Libert, I hope you find it both an informative and informational uh, this afternoon. I think you will. And with that, I say we get started, Steve. Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, joining us via Zoom <laughs> from Texas is uh, uh, General Vince Brooks, who's a former commander of the United Nations Command, Combined Forces Command in U.S. Forces Korea. He spent his final 17 years as a general officer, and in nearly all those years in command of large, complex military organizations in challenging situations. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome uh, General Brooks from Texas. Sir. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. And I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and begin here first by thanking Steve Lee for inviting me to do this. And as always, for the legendary John Hamry of CSIS and my good friend of so many years and my predecessor in Korea, General Mike Scaparati, uh, now leading the Korea Defense Veterans Association. Uh, thank you to both of you for what it is that your organizations do to keep this alliance focused and alive and increasingly in the eyes of, uh, of the international public, not just the American public. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share some time with you today. Uh, it won't take long because you've got a tremendous panel awaiting you. And uh, as we work our way through the discussions today, it would be a lot better if I were there in person. I apologize that I could not be in Washington today, but uh, I hope that the wonders of technology will hold out well enough for us to be able to get, uh, get through a few observations. My, my task today is to really talk about what it's like to serve in United Nations Command. And as with any large organization that has multiple echelons, it may be a little bit different from one echelon to the next in terms of exactly what the experience is. I'd love to talk to you about the full history of UN Command, but I think the, the panel will get into that in a lot better detail and with uh, more sufficient time to do so. Uh, but it, it's very clear that this is an enduring command, first started in 1950 and continuing in 2023, no gaps in between. And a, as it has changed and adapted over time, uh, it has always remained focused on initially war fighting, but since 1953, always on the preservation of the armistice. Remember, UN Command is one of the three signatories to the armistice agreement that brought a cessation to hostilities on the Korean Peninsula, but didn't quite deliver peace. And that's the condition that we find ourselves in even to this day, where situations can change very, very quickly. Inside of UN Command, you'll, you'll find uh, different things. First, you'll find that this is a multinational headquarters, a, a, an existing standing multinational headquarters with an international mandate Focus on the Korean Peninsula and on support for it from Japan. And at, at the, it, it's constructed really of a headquarters element, 
and then several subordinate operating arms. And I'll talk about each one of them just uh, to give you an idea of what are they doing? What, what, what goes on in those organizations? And I'm confident that anything that I uh, leave unaddressed, the current deputy commander will be able to, to clean up and uh, lay out much better. The headquarters staff, of course, the commander is the senior American who's in the country. That commander is triple headed, but the senior most among the three commands is the United Nations Command. So it's always described as Commander UN Command, Commander of the ROC US Combined Forces Command, and Commander US Forces Korea. And those really have uh, the, the precedence of time on that. Inside of that headquarters staff, you'll find that there are now, especially in the last several years, uh, fewer officers that are multiple hatted. Some of the Americans still have multiple hats, and a few of the Koreans have multiple hats. But the uh, Australian, Canadian, Colombian, Danish, and uh, elements of the United Kingdom who are present in that staff are focused on the work of United Nations Command. And that's been very important. The, the long history says that this was an American staff that was carried uh, by General MacArthur into Japan and then conducted operations from Japan back in 1950. It, it now is a much more multinational staff that signals commitment from each one of those countries every single day. And of course, it's varying grades of staff officers from junior grade non-commissioned officers all the way up to three-star generals who provide advice to the UN commander and help to oversee the entirety of the process and fulfilling the legitimacy of United Nations Command. In 2017, we were very fortunate to begin to have a series of deputy commanders at the three-star level from some country other than the United States. From 1950 to 2017, it was always an American. Since 2017, it has never been an American and in my way of thinking should never be ever again. Uh, we were very fortunate to have then Lieutenant General Wayne Eyre from Canada as the first one who was committed into that by Canada in response to our ask for getting additional support. He has since gone on to become the Chief of Defense Staff in Canada. So he's the top officer in the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, Vice Admiral Stuart Mayer came in after him from Australia and did a great job as well carrying on this tradition of a non-American in the seat and departed to, to command the Australian fleet. And now, of course, Lieutenant General Andrew Harrison, whom, uh, from whom we'll hear comments in just a few moments, is currently in the seat from the United Kingdom. Each one of these flag officers is a superb example of their military. It's, they're literally the best of the best, and that's borne out by what they do after they leave United Nations Command. So this is a very important commitment by these countries. Now, some of them form what is the first subordinate arm of the United Nations Command, and that's the United Nations Command Military Armistice Commission, and extended from it the secretariat for that Military Armistice Commission. The Armistice Commission is the one that actually manages the armistice on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything from engaging in dialogue when the opportunities open themselves at the flag officer level, to uh, overseeing and supervising any interactions that happen along the DMZ between the North Korea People's Army and the United Nations Command, including the Republic of Korea. Now that commission continues to be very important. I'll tell you that North Korea has walked away from their side of the Military Armistice Commission, but the commission nevertheless continues its duties on the South, preserving the armistice and being ever ready to work through points of friction and lead to conditions of peace if they can be achieved. Uh, there's a senior member of that Military Armistice Commission who since 1994 is a Republic of Korea Major General. And that has been a very important step in increasing the influence and the authority of South Korea within the United Nations Command. The next subordinate piece of that is the United Nations Command uh, Joint Security Area uh, Security Battalion. It's essentially an infantry battalion that is literally sitting on the line. There is no American force that is further forward than that one. And oh, by the way, it's not all American. It is part American and part Korean, fully integrated into a operating infantry unit. 
And they are the ones who are sitting in Pemlin Jam. They, they keep it secure on a day-to-day -day basis. They have quick reaction forces to respond to it. They're sitting in outposts that look like the re re literally the residual of the Korean War. And there has been many an incident that has happened in the face of that battalion. So they literally are the ones who are just steps away from North Korea and the North Korean People's Army. Every now and then they get commingled when someone crosses the border and an incident occurs, as in November of 17, or very recently, as we just saw. And sometimes those erupt into gunfire or the brandishing of axes, like the murder of uh, Major Arthur Boniface and Lieutenant Mark Barrett back in 1976. It happened there, and they were in that unit. And so it's a very tense job for them. Most of Korea is ready to fight tonight. In the Joint Security Area Security Battalion, they're ready to fight in the next five minutes. And that's the way it is. And, and they're an amazing unit. It's an honor to serve there. They have extremely high discipline standards and great pride. And whenever I was able to spend time with them, it just filled my heart to be with them. Uh, there are difficult days for them uh, that, that happen from time to time uh, and very challenging circumstances that happen. It's austere. It's, it's difficult work, uh, but they truly are in front of them all. Uh, there's another subordinate arm of United Nations Command as well, and the, and the experience there is different than it is in the Joint Security Battalion. That's the United Nations Command Honor, Honor Guard Company. And while you will see them most often at ceremonies, their origin comes from being Douglas MacArthur's security detail. And they carry on their role and responsibility from before the Korean War all the way to the present. And uh, their, their important role reflects also the continued commitment of several countries. So in addition to the United States and South Korea, and oh, by the way, South Korea has Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine elements inside of that uh, Honor Guard company. Uh, there are also Philippine and Thai soldiers who are inside of there. These are enlisted soldiers in nearly every case. The officer leadership is, is American. Uh, but they're there standing in front. And maybe they're the ones who receive remains that are uh, repatriated from North Korea, or that they bring back remains to China or North Korea from the Korean War. They're there at every change of command ceremony. They were there for me and General Scaparotti and every single one since. And they do a great job with extremely high discipline and standards to signify what UN command is and what the alliance is. It contains both. And finally, I'd just highlight that there's yet another experience. As John Hamry mentioned, there are seven bases in Japan that are the, pr the primary supporting locations for United Nations Command. They were during the war, and they continue to be so. If there's an international commitment under the auspices of United Nations Command, they often will flow through one of these seven bases. They happen to also be U.S. bases, and in some cases are dual use with Japan's self-defense force bases. But the primary authority, authority resides still with the United Nations Command, and they're critically important. I'm talking about places like Yokota, uh, Yokosuka Naval Base, Camp Zama, Sasebo, uh, White Beach, uh, Kadena, very important locations throughout the area, and Putinma, which is the, the final of the seven. The UN Command rear is the last vestige of the original UN Command location, which was initially in Japan. And in 1954, as the establishment of US Forces Korea occurred, it moved into Korea and has stayed there ever since. So it's a very small element led by an Australian, and it's an international small headquarters that maintains that connectivity between the forward headquarters in Korea and the rear headquarters in Japan, as well as liaisoning with the Japanese self-defense forces, the Japanese government, and any nations that would pass through. Complex work, four to five people to get the job done on a day-to-day -day basis, and they too do amazing work. This is a small headquarters, as it should be. It's not a warfighting headquarters anymore, but really nothing can flow into or out of the Korean theater from the international perspective without the role of UN Command that still is the enforcer of the armistice, that still is the home for any international commitments, that still enables dialogue between North and South. All these things are critical roles for United Nations Command that are not well understood. So I, I appreciate everyone being there today.
And for your interest in diving into this a little bit more fully, to me, it's a command that is underappreciated and undervalued, but critically important now and especially into the future. And so I'm honored to have shared some thoughts with you today. I, I, I'm certain that the panel discussion will be outstanding. And I'll just yield here. Thank you all very much once again. Take care. Tachi kapsida. And over to you, Steve. Thanks. So, um, General Brooks, sir, thank you for joining us. Uh, he's been just very busy this week, but we're very thankful he was able to do that through Zoom. I was very fortunate to serve in my last assignment in Korea um, as his uh, secretary of the United Nations Command Military Armistice Commission. Uh, and so, again, thank you, sir. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we will now transition to our panel discussion. So we welcome our speakers uh, to the stage. We're very fortunate to have several senior leaders and experts who will help us better understand the important role that the United Nations Command and the 17 sending states play in the defense and security of the Republic of Korea. Serving as the moderator is Dr. Victor Cha, the CSIS Senior Vice President for Asia and the Korea Chair. He joined CSIS in May uh, 2009. He was appointed in 2021 by the Biden administration to serve on the Defense Policy Board. And he has uh, formally served on the National Security Council uh, from 2004 to 2007. He is a two-time Fulbright Scholar and currently serves on 10 editorial boards of academic journals. So Dr. Cha and the panel, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Um, well, thank you, uh, Steve, for that introduction. Thank you to Dr. Hamry and to General Brooks for the great opening comments. Um, um, before we get started with this panel, I wanted to just zoom back a little bit and uh, take stock of um, not just this event, but this year being both the 70th anniversary of the Alliance uh, as well as of the armistice. Um, when I, as um, she mentioned, I teach at Georgetown on international relations. And when we get to the topic of military alliances, I tell my students that um, uh, there is no alliance that has been as successful as the US-Korea alliance in the history of alliances in international relations, especially when we consider where it started from in 1953 in a very transactional deal that was made with the South Korean president to where it is today, an alliance that when Mark was ambassador, he used to talk about an alliance that not only did a job on the peninsula, but was breaking new frontiers where the US-Korea alliance was operating far outside of its initial mandate, which was to de de deter and defend if necessary against the second North Korean uh, invasion. Um, as we celebrate the 70th year of the alliance, um, the, there really has been no relationship, bilateral relationship that I think has grown more than that between uh, the US and Korea. And, and that's something, that's a message I will continue to send to every audience I speak to about the Alliance. And I think the events of this year, uh, the recent state visit by President Yun to the White House, all are testament to how the Alliance continues to grow. And it does so in large part because of people in this room and people on this stage, uh, former ambassador and a former um, US UNC, uh, um, CFC, USFK commander. So let me properly introduce them before we, uh, before we begin our discussion. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with General Scaparati, who is now currently senior counselor for the Cohen Group. Um, um, uh, General Scaparati completed a distinguished 41 year career in the US Army as commander, US European Command and Supreme Allied Commander Europe, NATO. Um, prior to that, as you all know, he was uh, uh, served as commander of U.S. Forces Korea, United Nations Command and Combined Forces Command from 2013 to 2016. He also served as director of the Joint Staff, commander of the ISAF and deputy commander of U.S. Forces Afghanistan, the commanding general of I Corps and Joint Base Lewis McCord and the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division. He was also 69th commandant of the cadets at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and had commanded forces in Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, Support Hope, 
joint endeavor and assured response. He's a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1978. Um, joining us uh, via um, uh, Zoom is uh, Lieutenant General Andrew Harrison, currently Deputy Commander of United Nations Command Korea. Thank you, General Harrison, for waking up at a very early hour to, to join us. Uh, you definitely get the Iron Man Award for today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, uh, General Harrison commanded U uh, United Kingdom troops in Afghanistan and was awarded the U.S. Legion of Mer Merit for his service in Kabul. Um, from May 2020, he was in the United States as a senior British military advisor to Central Command and prom promoted to Lieutenant General in December of 2021 upon assuming uh, Deputy Command of United Nations Command Korea. Um, <clears throat> he had previously also served in Iraq um, uh, uh, twice in 2003 with the liberation of Iraq. And then in 2006, he was awarded the Queen's Commendation for his service in Iraq. Uh, General Harrison also served in Afghanistan where he assumed command of the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment and we also received the Dis Distinguished Service Order for his leadership. He's also served in Sierra Leone um, and was appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire for his conduct uh, when he was in captivity. He was actually captured uh, while serving in Sierra Leone. Um, again, G General Harrison, thank you so much for joining us from, uh, from Korea. Uh, and then last but not least, certainly Ambassador Mark Lippert, currently Executive Vice President and Chief Risk Officer for Samsung Electronics. Uh, uh, ambassador Lippert from 2014 to 2017 served as our ambassador in uh, the Republic of Korea. Uh, he had also previously served as Chief of Staff to Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel from 2013 to 2014 and as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs. Uh, and you were also Chief of Staff at the White House on the National Security Council. Um, <clears throat> Mark has also served uh, a very distinguished uh, uh, career in the military. He was an intelligence officer in the United States Navy, where he mobilized for active duty from 2009 to 2011 for service with the Navy Special Warfare SEALs Development Group that included deployments to Afghanistan. Uh, in 2007, 2008, he also deployed as an intelligence officer with SEAL Team 1 in Anbar Province, Iraq, in support of Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and, uh, of course, uh, uh, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Stanford, uh, played some baseball there, I remember, uh, and uh, also has an MA from Stanford, Stanford as well. So thank you, the three gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for your current and previous service, both to um, the Alliance and to, uh, um, uh, to the uh, U.S. policy in the region. Um, so to begin, I thought I'd start with Mark, if that's okay, and um, uh, to talk a little bit uh, before we talk about the UN, United Nations Command and sending states, I thought I'd ask Mark to start, start off by offering us his thoughts on uh, the recently concluded um, NCG, the Nuclear Consultative Group, uh, uh, that just happened in Korea uh, last week, uh, as well as the port call uh, that we saw that um, uh, was timed with the with the opening of the NCG. And I guess the quite, first, I'd love Mark to get your overall thoughts on it. But the, you know, the question I think is whether these activities that we are seeing now, all derivative of the Washington Declaration, the state visit last April, um, are really answering the mail on extended deterrence in terms of signaling capabilities and resolve. And of course, it's about signaling capabilities and resolve to two audiences, right? The, on the one hand, uh, the DPRK, but also perhaps even more importantly, confidence in, in the South, by, by the South Korean ally and U.S. extended deterrence commitment. So, Mark, why don't we start with that, and you can give us your thoughts. All right, thanks, Victor, and a great honor to be here. Thanks to everybody. It's intimidating because literally everyone in the audience could be on the panel and vice versa. So <laughs> it's like the triple graduate <laughs> seminar at Georgetown. Uh, and um, 
Second, let me just thank uh, KDVA and CSIS. We had a lunch yesterday to get ready for this. Vince Brooks did a great job of sort of walking us through some of the issues. Whenever uh, General Brooks was talking, uh, John Hammer was taking feverish notes. Whenever I was talking, pen, pens went down. So I hope <laughs> to do better today. Um, so uh, let me just say, I, I do think on the Washington Declaration, the recent activity with the Ohio class submarine visiting, I do think it represents a big step forward. Um, and I do think, as you point out, it balances three key goals, I think, especially with respect to the Republic of Korea, but not exclusive to it. Uh, one, it addresses, begins to address public opinion in South Korea, which was putting increasing pressure on successive governments to do more on this issue. And I think what became very interesting about the public opinion in South Korea is it used to be that you would ask questions about reintroduction or indigenous nuclear capabilities, you would get high polling, 50 to 70 percent, depending on the poll, you'd start to talk about the costs and poll numbers would precipitously drop, right, in terms of support. Those that cascading effects stopped, right? And even with the cost baked in, public opinion started to look more durable and resilient. And I think rightly so, the alliance saw that being two, de two democracies um, adapted, right? And I think adapted adroitly. The, the other two goals, by the way, non-proliferation, right? You don't want to overemphasize nuclear weapons, right? That's a key goal, I think, of the Biden administration. So you've got about takes that that into account with all the global equities. And finally, deterrence, right? In terms of sending the strong signal, which Victor mentioned. So all three goals, I think, uh, largely were balanced effectively by the declaration, Washington Declaration. I think the declaration as I said, is a big step forward, but it is deliberately ambiguous and it is deliberately at a strategic level. You wouldn't want something overly prescriptive at this point. And so implementation to get to the point is key. Um, and the visit of the submarine was important. And you're asking me, is it enough? No, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And I would say two buckets where, where things need to be need, need to be done is first, I think, as we are thinking about how to more demonstrably basically um, display the deterrent capabilities, which I think there are creative solutions there, and I think those will unfold. The other part is bringing about the non-nuclear capabilities into the mix, right? Like directed energy, like the things the CSIS report put on that I think have not gotten enough attention in the Washington Declaration uh, publicity, basically, is that it need, you need a both and strategy. And then, so I think what you're going to have to see is very careful calibration between military officers, diplomats, politicians on three things. One, how to do the nuclear piece. Two, what other capabilities can augment augment that and get you out of this conversation that you'll have to trade Seoul for Los Angeles or Seoul for Seattle, if you have directed energy and some other Iron Dome-like capabilities, aero, things like that, you know, that gets more, that, that, that helps, I think, over time. And as those technologies evolve and roll out, will play a more important role. And finally, I would just say the messaging, right? I mean, you have to, Korea is a, is a country with about 11 to 13 daily newspapers. Right? We have about three here in the United States, huge media conglomerates. So, getting that piece right of public diplomacy will absolutely critical. Final point, and I'll stop. We have a history of doing this actually effectively. And I would point the most recent example to this is the one, two, three agreement, right? Here you had to balance public opinion that was strongly supportive of a civilian enrichment capability, right? Number one. Number two, key nuclear energy goals, right? And number three, again, non-proliferation goals and the global impact it could have. And I will say, I think that was done adroitly by the State Department nonproliferation bureaus, the Korean government, right, with some help by outside validators, mainly Bob Einhorn, who did a great job of, of signaling about where this was going. And I think the, to get off the stage, perhaps the most important thing of it, it was not overly prescriptive. It did not prejudge things like the fuel cycle study. And what it did do is allow space for the alliance to adapt uh, uh, move and basically fill important gaps uh, on all three of these questions. And let me just stop there and turn it back to you, Victor. Well, can I just follow up on one uh, point that that you that you made, particularly with regard to public opinion on this? Because 
the subtext of the Washington Declaration was that a lot of it was being driven, at least somewhat in Washington, by all of these, well, not all of these, but several polls that came out um, in South Korea about their views on, you know, South Korea, quote unquote, going nuclear. Um, I mean, I, I mean, public, public opinion polling is important, but how significant as someone who's, you know, uh, um, say Korea for quite some time, how significant is is public polling in that regard when it comes to a question like this? You know, huge national security decisions. How important is public opinion polling? My my theory on this is that if you had asked the same question of people in this room, like sort of strategic elites, people who are involved or have been involved in policymaking, that you get a very different result. So I'm just, I mean, your your thoughts on on how important the, because they did become a bit of an echo chamber in the run up to the state visit. Yeah, no, but so first I would say, make a substantive point in that what I liked about the approach is it felt like it was just right in terms of calibrating to public opinion. Let me get to answer your question in mm -hmm. just one second. In that the Washington Declaration flowed, I think, logically from the already ongoing work on the extended deterrence dialogue, things that were already underway. And so it didn't overreach and overreact, I think. It landed in a, in a very good spot and gave optionality for where it went, right? We didn't over-rotate, to use a, an aviation term. On your, on your question, I would say, look, it's, it's an important but not the only data point that you consider, right? And I think you're right. Look, in, in Korea, with all the media outlets, with um, you know, the fact that you can bump into the same people multiple times a day, you do have the risk of the echo chamber effect. So I think the important thing there is sampling of one, public opinion, to how are the democratic politicians thinking about it? And then what are the national security elites thinking about it? A couple of other voices too. Get off the peninsula, also reevaluate, reassess, do some consultations in Washington, get away, and then work to make a judgment call in consultation with uh, your good uh, friends, partners, and allies inside the Korean government and the US government. Great, thanks. Uh, and also always consult CSIS too and KDVA. Right. Yes, so that's, yeah, so <laughs> that's go, just yeah. a given. I think. Yeah, yeah. So it's baked in. It's baked in. <laughs> um, okay, let me let me uh, move to General Scaparati and first, General. If there's anything that you wanted to add or comment on with regard to the Washington Declaration, the NCG, these these questions about um, um, extended nuclear deterrence, but then I'd also like to ask you of um, of your assessment of the threat posed by North Korea. As we all know, uh, in the same week that these events were happening on the Korean Peninsula with regard to the alliance, North Korea was keeping busy with more uh, ballistic missile tests. Um, and I guess the question I have for you is, um, both from a conventional and a WMD dimension, uh, your assessment of the threat now compared to when you held the command um, and does this North Korean drive for, you know, it's a pretty transparent drive now for survivable capabilities, um, uh, overhead intelligence, satellite intelligence capabilities, tactical nuclear capabilities. Is this pushing the peninsula into a much less stable situation or uh, is deter are we pretty confident that deterrence, that deterrence can hold? Yeah, thank you, Victor. It's a privilege to be on the board with each of you. Uh, I've served with Mark, as you know, when he was the ambassador. And uh, and again, uh, I, I've talked to General Harrison here as well uh, in the recent times. So I appreciate to be a part of this, this great group. Um, I, I would like to make a comment about the Washington Declaration. And that is it personally, I believe it hit the mark very well, as, mm -hmm. as Mark said. I, when I thought about this, um, having been in the command in, in Korea and then gone to NATO, where we have a nuclear planning group. It's also a nuclear alliance, as you might say. I, I believe strongly that there were um, areas within the extended deterrence that the Koreans were right to say, we need more information. We need more transparency. We need to understand this better. And by the same token, as is a part of the declaration, strategic operations don't happen happen without a very strong conventional component. 
And that brings the Korean conventional opponent component into this as well. So I think that's equally important. But the declaration itself touched on the areas that I thought would be of importance to have those discussions with Korea to hit it right. It wasn't too detailed, but it was the correct areas. In terms of whether it's enough, I, I agree with the ambassador. There's plenty of work to do here. There's a lot of work. It's got to be done in order to satisfy, I think, the call that has been made by Korea. Uh, in the areas that, that were outlined, intelligence, command and control, operations, exercises, training, et cetera, the conventional piece of this, um, there is a lot of work that has to be done there. And so the important thing for us is let's move on, let's get on with it, and let's be true to that. And on the Korean part, to actually go to work, because this is complex business, they also have to show that kind of diligence for this to work. There's a lot of education that's going to take part here to be that partner uh, if they want the agreement they ask for. So I think there's a two two parts to that, and and I'll leave it leave it at that. But I really applauded what both countries have agreed to here. Mm -hmm. The fact that we had the first meeting pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and the demonstration that took place on the day that they met a demonstration and a demonstration of will that North Korea cannot ignore, in my view. Now, in terms of my time in command and, and the change that's taken place, Victor, if you go back to 2013, uh, at that point, um, Kim Jong-un had just taken over um, months prior to me taking coming into command. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty about how he would progress. But uh, in very short order, he first focused on his conventional capability. If you recall, he began doing not only training that was directed, but he started doing no notice training. And then those commanders who didn't perform disappeared. One general became a private and a rifleman, as I recall, <laughs> uh, pretty brutal. That was a significant step because up until that time, their conventional force was large, but not well trained. Over the years, he's made a difference because he was serious about setting standards, et cetera. So I think it has changed. The conventional capabilities improved. Now, having said that, they still uh, don't operate in the combined arms level above battalion and, and probably not well at battalion at all, et cetera. But if you've been a rifleman or a cannoneer for 11 years in the same piece of equipment, don't underestimate their ability to use it and the fact that they've got a large force there that's quite a threat. In terms of their nuclear capability, I think they probably had two or three weapons we assessed when I took over, someplace around perhaps 50 now, correct? Yeah. Not only that, have they developed the capability, but they've developed the capabilities in, in various forms tactical to strategic. Um, they have uh, they have tested uh, cruise missile hypersonic, for instance. Um, the ICBM that I mentioned. So, you know, they, they have enough and now they're beginning to explore how differently you can use that. When you couple that with the satellite capability that they're trying to develop, which gives them a better picture of the posture across and the better ability to target, um, you have to be greatly concerned about how much they've advanced. So yes, they've advanced. And I think it is a greater threat today. Um, I think the alliance itself has adapted well. I, I believe, yes, we can deter them. Yes, we can keep and will keep uh, the peninsula stable. But what we're doing today within the alliance in terms of the focus on training within the alliance in terms of the Washington Declaration, the things we're beginning to do there, the continued um, uh, investment that Korea is making in their armed forces each and every year and the technology that they're employing for air defense and other things are all important for us to maintain the ability to both deter and, and certainly defend uh, uh, if it comes to that on the, on the peninsula. I could take, pick up the last point that you made about the, the efforts that the ROC are making to invest in their own capabilities. Do you see changes in that over time? So like considering the current government versus 
previous governments and also when you were, you held the command, do you feel like there is um, there is? A, I mean, I mean, I, I know there have been always things that we've wanted the rocks to do in that right. regard, and whether they're sort of answering the mail on that or or or, or, or changes that we've seen, particularly under this government, the new government, right. not so new anymore, but the government. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, over the time period we're talking about from 2013, they have advanced in terms of their own development. Mm. Throughout all of that, regardless of the administrations, um, they've been, what, five, six, seven percent increase in defense spending year on year, pretty much. Mm. Probably the lowest four or five percent. You probably know, but it's but it's been an increase every year. Mm -hmm. They've uh, they've had a greater focus uh, beginning in the Moon administration and beyond now with developing their own capabilities and focusing on their own defense industry. When, when we were there, they were talking about the defense industry being another portion of growing their economy, and they were just beginning to focus. But I, Ambassador, would be interested in your thoughts, but I think they've made great strides in that. And uh, so, yes, they are. Uh, if I had, um, if I had a, uh, an encouragement for them, it would be to focus on specific systems at a faster pace, and perhaps not all of them at the same pace. Because there are some, like air defense, which they're developing, which I think are far more important here in the short term mm -hmm. uh, than some other systems. Right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go to uh, General Harrison now. Um, again, General, thank you so much for joining us in the wee hours of the morning there in Seoul. Um, uh, first, a a any, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I welcome you to make any follow-on comments to what you've heard thus far from the two speakers on the topics that we've discussed. Um, but then I'd also ask if you could share with us um, uh, how, you know, the, the, how the UK has decided to support UNC with a very senior officer. Um, again, as we discussed, I think, and as Dr. Henry mentioned in his earlier comments, uh, I think there's not a very good understanding of how Korea's defense is supported, uh, not just by the alliance, but by these 17 um, UNC sending states. So if you could offer us your impressions of this aspect of Korea's defense in your time in the command, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, uh, so the, I'm turning the floor over to you. Over to you, General. Thank you very much. And if a thumbs up would indicate that someone can hear me in Washington, that would be great. Fantastic. Um, uh, firstly, what, what an honor to be on the panel, um, even, even if it is virtually. Um, and at such an important time in the Republic of Korea. Uh, and if I could start just by touching on that. Firstly, uh, yesterday I spoke to um, a veteran called Michael Woodley, who was up at Panmunjom um, in the Joint Security Area. And in 1950, he'd come to uh, Korea and he landed in Busan and he marched uh, predominantly on foot from Pusan, right on the southern tip of Korea, all the way up to the Yalu, came back down on foot to the 38th parallel and fought in four major battles, including um, the famous Battle of Kapyong, where uh, the UNC forces held the line to prevent um, Seoul falling in the sort of third phase of the war. You know, what a privilege to meet 63 of these people who are over here for the 70th anniversary uh, of the of the signing of the armistice, which the, that armistice is in the Guinness Book of Records as the, the world's longest successful armistice. So it's great to be part of that. Um, I, I would say from the discussion so far, um, it, it, it strikes me that the knowledge that exists in the panel and in the audience there today is unique because um, the United Nations command, I have discovered, is so poorly understood globally and poorly understood on the peninsula. Um, and for two reasons, I think any efforts we can make to improve the understanding of the United Nations Command, its role and its function in current, but potentially more uh, into the future in terms of both uh, crises and potential of conflict, is, is what actually does the UNC bring to the defence of the Republic of Korea and stability 
uh, across the peninsula. And the first of those uh, would be legitimacy. Um, there's much discussion in Washington um, and in the United Nations Command, but predominantly in, in Washington and from the US officers uh, here about extended deterrence. And there's uh, an incredible debate that's been going on since my um, time here about the, the value of extended deterrence. And deterrence is definitely changing here. So it has moved, in my personal view, from deterring uh, the inflow of real capability into DPRK's arsenal. And arsenal, they told the world how they were going to expand at the Eighth Party Congress in January 2021. And they are doing that. So in many ways, that ship might have sailed. But Deterring DPRK from using that capability is now the absolute aim of deterrence, in my view. And what the United Nations Command gives is extended deterrence globally because there are those 17 nations involved in the United Nations Command with skin in the game and an ability uh, and an interest, uh, an ability to, to influence decision making and uh, an interest in terms of the capabilities they bring from around the globe. Um, so that, that legitimacy in the messaging that all the um, member states provide, and then the capabilities that they could bring if we move to crisis or, um, or conflict is really important in deterring, in parallel with the ROC US uh, alliance and the capabilities they bring. And the second thing that is rarely talked about, but becoming more obvious in the context of the, of the fighting in Ukraine, is the value of strategic depth it, across all of the instruments of power. But, but if one looks at how important that strategic depth has been for the Ukraine and how allies and partners become all of a sudden incredibly valuable, then you can see that actually having 17 nations all with a unified purpose, it could be um, absolutely vital uh, into, into the future. Because, and again, I think this is, this is where things have fundamentally changed, the Republic of Korea and the, the challenges on the peninsula, in my view, have moved with accelerating pace from being a regional problem, some would argue a problem across two countries, but a regional problem, certainly to one that is now global. And whilst the world is distracted by, um, by the conflict in the Ukraine and by you know, other um, threats and competitors in the region, actually the, the, the range of weapons that are now in play from DPRK the quantity of weapons that's been touched on that are now in play uh, and the ever improving nature of those weapons means that Washington is in the game physically as well as just being in terms of what support could be offered, um, offered in terms of uh, movement of troops onto the peninsula. So that then links back into to what General um, Scaparotti and General Brooks have talked about in terms of the value of Japan um, and, uh, and the economic uh, consequences of crisis and conflict um, on the peninsula becomes ever more important as Asia becomes this powerhouse of the global economy. So, so things are changing and are, are changing quite fast becoming more important, I would argue. Um, and, and therefore, I think the United Nations Command and those member states that contribute, it, uh, contribute to it are seeing that. And we're seeing a slow uh, acceleration of interest from the member states into the value of United Nations Command. And that, going back to the, the question at the start, is the reason that the UK has supported, supported my tenure here. I'm the most senior British officer east of the Suez Canal since the mid 70s. And that in some way indicates a perspective that we're getting from all the member states who are now showing um, much more interest in what is going on in, in North Asia. We are 
UNC, exclusively focused on DPRK, rather than um, discussing or training for towards actions in other parts of the region. Um, but I, I think for the member states, it gives them real insight into what's going on into Asia. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if we saw more and more interest manifesting itself into more and more um, uh, uh, troops on exercise and potentially greater support physically into the United Nations command into the future. And uh, I will um, pause there. And again, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, today. Uh, thank you, uh, General. If I could just follow up, you mentioned the refer, refer to, first, wonderful, thank you so much. That was an excellent answer. You referred a couple of times to increasing interest by member states in, in, in UNC. Um, uh, and then you referred to possibly having roles in exercising uh, or things of this nature. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more to that and talk about sort of the interest this interesting increasing interest that you have noticed like where has it come from in what form has it come uh how has it manifested itself uh that i think i think we'd be curious to to know more more about that um, yeah if, if we, i wait, are we off the record are we on the record or off the record are we what are the yeah. oh, okay so and yes yeah, so we're all on the record so yeah 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 um Absolutely. So in terms of training, first of all, um, there are these two massive exercises, Uchi Freedom Shield, uh, which is a an exercise that runs really from the government all the way down to um, the, the components across the command. Um, and, and that occurs in the autumn is just about to, to start over here. Um, and then uh, Freedom Shield, which occurs at all uh, all levels below the government level and that's in the spring so these are two opportunities which with the with the changes in afghanistan and the reductions in iraq give member states an opportunity to to train and exercise in real complexity um, on the peninsula and from their own headquarters in a scenario that changes uh, every iteration, but includes space and cyber and you know, all the, the modern aspects of multi-domain operations, um, which is a rare opportunity. So, so member states are identifying that and seeing this is one of the um, few opportunities that exists globally to become involved in an exercise and training of that complexity. And of course, that adds to readiness. So, so that's the first bit internally into Korea. Externally, and we've just finished Talisman Sabre um, in Australia, um, we are trying to, to assist ROC forces in their movement into a global training environment. And really, for 70 years, the ROC has been focused on their internal training and training on the peninsula. And it's very hard for them to leave the peninsula because of the ever-present threat. But once they get into uh, training exercises such as um, Talisman Sabre uh, in Australia, they get to see how warfare has developed since the, since the threat from their country became apparent in 1950 and actually allows them to leap forward in terms of um, operating in a modern complex uh, environment. Uh, and so we are trying to assist more and more with ROC moving to member states in order to train uh, and, and get their officers and units to have a flavor of what uh, other member states are doing in terms of preparations for conflict. So those those two areas, um, I, I think, are really important in the development and into the future of the United Nations Command. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Um, let me go back to General Scaparotti um, and uh, ask you, I mean, um, and, and I, I know that you addressed some of this in your opening remarks um, um, a little bit ago, but uh, if you could talk about in your when you held the command and arriving in 2013, you wore these three hats, but if you could talk about how you saw the role of UNC and, and sending states in defense and deterrence on the peninsula. And then also, if you could, we'd love to get your thoughts um, 
on the the what uh, what John had had raised earlier in his opening remarks that you know in CSIS we've done a number of these uh, exercises um, where I guess the question is um, uh, really what sort of role the UN sending states could UNC sending states can play in, in a in um, in a contingency with regard to Taiwan, not in the sense of sending troops to Taiwan, but in the sense of what role can UN sending states play in reinforcing deterrence on the peninsula if something were to happen, if something were to happen in Taiwan? Yeah, thank you, Victor. Well, first of all, I, I did give a little lead into this. As yeah. I took command, uh, as most of us do, I think your focus is on the alliance, um, you go into that, you begin exercises right away, et cetera. Um, the alliance itself is very well organized. I mean, you have, uh, you know, a framework that you work out of with both above and below you. Um, there's established uh, memorandums of operation and how you make decision making. All of those things you get into so that you can exercise them and fully understand and begin to build the relationships you need to build as a, as a commander. And in the course of that, um, with at that time UNC with all American at least dual-hatted officers, you know I realized as we went into them one uh, there is a need uh, for UNC uh, to be more capable beyond the focus militarily on the the DMZ and on the military aspect of that yeah. um, alone. There in, in the experience there was, too, that, you know, we had, I think, in my time, about three major crises. Uh, every one of those pointed to the importance of UNC. Uh, an example would be August of 15, cross-border fires and a landmine incident. It was actually UNC officers on the border that... Um, were immediately able to glean some of the factual information that even our sensors were not able to give us, you know, a certainty. And their reporting and the trust in their reporting was, in my view, essential information to the, to the ROC minister and others who then went right into negotiations, as you recall, with North Korea. It's always helpful to have the facts. Um, UNC is constantly there, and that was apparent. So those were the things that, that drove me to try and develop um, it beyond just the military perspective. The ambassadors there were very responsive. And in those crises, obviously, they wanted to know what we knew. How can we help? And from that, we decided, let's begin to meet so that we have a relationship before the crisis we have procedures with which to inform them. And of course, they then use their diplomatic, economic, and informational capabilities or powers from each of those nations as they saw fit around that crisis that was going on in the peninsula. And then we developed that into being able to use that uh, positively for stability outside of the crisis time. So to your last question, I think there's absolutely opportunity um, you know, we exist, the military formations exist, and UNC in particular has a mandate to maintain stability on the peninsula, to enforce the armistice. Those 16 other nations, given the other powers outside of the military that they possess, much as General Harrison just said, that's, that's a powerful ingredient. And that can be employed even if Taiwan, Taiwan were to become a crisis if something were brewing there in order to maintain stability on the peninsula as well. That's a lot of signaling by a number of countries. Yeah. And we've seen in Ukraine and others where that's just so important. Yeah. Um, I didn't finish my thought. We exist to keep the peace, right, in the military. But really, it's the diplomacy and those other elements of power that are so important in the advance to actually do that. We're the muscle that supports it. That's it. Interesting. So, um, the, um, uh, I want to go to Mark now. Your any any comments that you would like to make on uh, UNC and the role of sending states in peacetime and in wartime? Um, a number of references have been made to this meeting of the ambassadors of the UN sending states, um, and then 
General Harrison's point about um, legitimacy and strategic depth, right? That this that the UN UNC provides to Korea. Um, uh, over to you. Yeah. Um, well, this, these could be all day questions. You yeah. know, well, I, I feel yeah. like I'm the host of Capital Cable now. Like, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Like, <laughs> um, that's right. Yeah, it's not fair. Um, I'll get my chance on Thursday. Anyway, yeah, the right. um, uh, so uh, I do think that what is unique, especially what General Harrison said, um, is that you have to dovetail on what he said or build on it is you do have this really important multilateral organization that has brings with it a strong sense of legitimacy. And what is one of our crucial talking points as a government that you hear over and over again from the United States, a rules-based international order, right? That where we resolve disputes peacefully in accordance with international law, you know, all of that is extant in UN command, right? And I think that's very important. Um, I think the second thing it does in terms of the ambassadors meeting, you know, look, the, it's a it's a wide, varied group. Um, it is it's you know this, in a way, a, a relic of time. It's a very interesting grouping. Uh, but I think what it one of the points that has not been touched on is that what it it enhances understanding of events on the peninsula in a regular way that would not otherwise occur. In that, I agree with uh, General Harrison's smaller point and maybe broaden it. I don't think the command is well understood. I don't think necessarily events in Korea are well understood beyond the headlines. And here is a forum where, you know, on a regular basis, the U.S., its allies can have this exchange to, if there is crisis, not just have an operational mechanism in place to trade information, but have a foundation of knowledge that I think is important. So I think that's the second second thing I would say. Um, I think on, um, you know, the, the signaling uh, piece, I would just say, look, they're just obviously everybody knows this the paucity of multilateral security organizations in Asia. I think the more you're strengthening, that sends a couple of signals. One, um, you know, how important it is to, to bring in the importance of Asia and friends, partners, allies working together collaboratively on Asia in an environment that otherwise is pretty ad hoc. And two, uh, I think the other thing it sends. The other message it sends is that the U.S. does have a long pattern and practice of working multilaterally. So I think those are important concepts. Let, let me just get off the stage by saying um, I do think that the issue um, in terms of – let me just say this way. What's, what I think is an interesting observation is at a moment in it, I just want to touch on General Scaparotti's point about the industrial defense industrial base, where one of the prongs that Korea is using to become a more global security partner is the defense industrial base with deals yeah. in Australia, India, Poland, right? Um, and a goal to be, I think, the fourth largest exporter. At that moment of being a more global partner on security terms through many other ways, but in defense industrial, you're inviting the rest of the world in through the UN command. And I think that's an interesting dynamic uh, to see those two mesh. And Victor, back to you. Great. Uh, yes, yeah, I, and Since we're talking about the global aspect that uh, General Harrison brought up as well, I think it's interesting when you look at the UN sending states, a number of those are European. And of the Europeans, only one is not a NATO member, Sweden, who will soon be. Now, that's a connection that's important, yeah. too. Because and particularly because of AP4 that was just announced. So you, you've already got a, a European Indo-Pacific connection, which I think is actually very, very important here. And so all of this begin, it can work together. There's an opportunity here. Yeah. That was actually the, the next set of questions I wanted to put to the group. And I want to start with um General Harrison, but General Scaparotti as as well, is that um so all of us myself included in the past year have been uh, participating in, at least in my case, groupings I had never participated in. Like I had never been invited to NATO headquarters before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've never, and CSIS has done a number of, of, um, of track 1.5, track 2 events with different organizations um, in Europe with regard to Indo-Pacific security. And I guess, so the question to General Harrison is that in, in your role now, 
I, I mean, what we what we've at least seen is really um, uh, a closing of what was a pretty wide gap in the Euro Atlantic and Indo Pacific theaters. I mean, someone like General Scaparotti is one of those rare people that you know served in this key position in the Indo Pacific and then went on to be mm -hmm. Supreme uh, NATO Commander. Uh, at least from a uh, UK European perspective, General Harrison, what is your sense of the way in which this war in Europe has focused European security minds on the end? I mean, obviously very focused on what's happening in Ukraine, but the extent to which that has created much more interest in the Indo-Pacific theater, largely Taiwan, I assume, but also Korea. Yeah, it is. It is undoubtedly shown the risk that exists if there's a conflagration in in any part of the world and again history tells us the risk of how quickly that can spread um, across a region or, or worst case um, across the world and the, and the United Nations command of course has all the five nations of AUKUS in it it has represent representation from you know states as far away as Colombia, it's got P5 members in it. You know, it's got France in it. It's got UK in it. It's got obviously the US in it. So, so the capabilities that the United Nations uh, Command could bring or has brought are incredibly powerful. And I think history tends to distort our view of Korea back to the 1950-53 war. And you know we think of deforested hills and black and white photos uh, of you know incredible courage on. On, on mountaintops, but the reality of modern warfare and the stuff that can be switched very rapidly, whether it's space capabilities, space-based capabilities, whether it's cyber-based capabilities, can be flicked around the world to, to improve capabilities that commanders always need more of. You know, you can never have enough uh, of those capabilities as, as a threat grows. Uh, and therefore, this is an incredible flexible asset, which will also, um, it also gives the power to the sovereign states within the United Nations command, because in the end, the commander will ask for or could ask for capabilities. And then it goes back to the sending states to, to answer the call. And the ROC government, I know, are starting to starting is probably the wrong word, are continuing to understand the value of those assets and how quickly they can be born. And it's no longer about only about the speed of getting heavy armor or whatever um, capabilities that were relevant in, in decades past onto the peninsula. It's more about, uh, it's, it, it's, it's more about a collation of capabilities that can generate effect many of which can be brought to bear very quickly. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thanks. General Mark, do you want to add anything to that? I just think uh, I, I agree uh, wholly with what he said. And I think, you know, that, that what we've seen in Ukraine is, is that we, we live in a connected world. And you can't say it's a regional uh, fight because it has global impact. It'll be true with Korea, Taiwan. Uh, the point I would pick up on is this um, multilateral approach of, of allies of like mind working together, whether it's in Korea, in the Indo-Pacific, in Europe, is extremely important because, as General Harrison just said, you don't flip a switch and operate in a multinational contingent. It is complex business. And the more that we do this in any of these theaters, and they are the same nations that are doing this, the better we get at that, the, the more that uh, that we understand each other and how we operate, the more likely that our procedures and our equipment will become interoperable. Uh, so I think that's an important aspect of this. Well, even if it's just the exchange of observers, mm -hmm. that's an important step. And that usually leads then to the force structure being the same. So, again, I think these are important steps that are being taken, taken by these countries, whether they're in Europe uh, or the Indo-Pacific. Yep. I just uh, 30 seconds and just say, maybe just to broaden it slightly in terms of non-traditional security mechanisms. Obviously, we're here to talk about, um, you know, the very, you know, hard security issues. But 
if you take a group grouping that is practiced and well rehearsed uh, on hard security measures, and then uh, General Harrison alluded to a little bit of this, but you can add on the space component, cyber, all the technology issues that are so critical in this geopolitical race we're in uh, across the globe, global health, right? Things like that, you scratch the surface. And if you've got the militaries and diplomats with cooperative habits in complex, you know, uh, I would say irregular multilateral institutions, it does augur well to help deal with some of these other tough issues. And let me just turn it back to you. Great, great, terrific. Yeah. Um, terrific. Um, so uh, with, with that, we're going to move to you all in the audience and give you the opportunity to ask questions of our of our panelists up here. We have folks with mics who are moving around. We'll go to General Sharp first. <laughs> who knows a little thanks. bit, he knows a little bit about this stuff yeah. too. So. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. Great, thanks. And uh, really appreciate the, uh, this great conference and the relationship now between CSIS and Korea Defense Veterans Association. Um, so, you know, when I commanded 2008 to 2011, it's very obvious to me that United Nations Command has grown both in capabilities and stature and importance from what it was when I was in command. When I was in command, the main thing that United Nations Command really did in overseeing the armistice was to do investigations of YPDO or the sinking of the Shunan and other things like that. But the capabilities have greatly, greatly expanded, which, uh, which I greatly applaud. So my comment and question is, so what should be the next steps? What are the most important next steps that are coming up? And, you know, I've got an idea or two, but I would appreciate your all's idea. Um, but before I give my thoughts on one or two ideas is I'm going to expand Dr. Hamry's scenario of, uh, of uh, North Korea doing something against South Korea of Taiwan to simultaneously Russia doing something with Japan. Um, and so when you look at it from the whole regional perspective, so some of the things that, you know, I, I see as I mean, great progress, and it sounds like from listening to General Harrison, maybe some of these have already got started it, for both a deterrent capability and a real fighting capability if something did happen, are more discussions, more codification of what types of capabilities different sending states would be willing to send, can send, depending upon the types of scenarios. General Harrison kind of talked about that. None of that happened when I was there. I mean, it was it, just none of that happened. They were there, there were presidents, it was important, but really getting down to, you know, what sorts of things, you know, can you do? You know, are there such things as status of forces that ought to be talked about and agreed to, um, you know, between the South Korea and the sending states? that if sending states did come in great forces and all, those types of mechanisms to be able to more quickly and more capability going in. And then the other one, which um, you may or may not want to comment on, is there, should there be a larger role for Japan in United Nations Command? Not only from the seven, you know, bases that we have there to help flow through, but from the self-defense force perspective and, and all of that. And, to go back to what I started with because of the regional part of this, but also because of the great capability that uh, that Japan is has now and is developing into the future. So my question again is, you know, what should be the most important next steps, both from a deterrence and from a capability perspective? Right. Great, great question. I mean, I if I think the authority here is uh, General Harrison, given is you know he's in command. I, I would tell you at the point I was at, sir, um, what we did as steps, and I think ones that ought to continue if they're not going there is we began to exercise those seven bases and make sure that the procedures and the agreements and the status of forces that existed were in fact um, relevant to the time, and so I think that should continue. And, uh, and perhaps it's being done routinely now, but we have begun to do that. The other was the, the reception and onward movement, the commitment of forces, what we might expect, how they might help in that. We were beginning to work those exercises as well as, um, you know, the, the, actually the movement of personnel off Peninsula <laughs> and through those bases if crisis were to come was also a part of that. And UNC paid a role in that as well. So those were the things that we were working on. And I think those absolutely still pertain to those things that we have to bring to maturity 
and I'm sure that General Harrison will correct me here. Yeah, General Harrison. Uh, I would never correct you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so clearly there is a lot of work going on. But if I could just mention a couple of areas where I think there is real opportunity. The first is is bringing uh, rock forces, staff officers into the UNC in some capacity. I think that's a great opportunity. And it always struck me as strange that the United Nations, core members of the United Nations headquarters staff were not rock. So I think that opportunity exists, and I hope we'll see some movement on that front. I think uh, the opportunities for member states to send formed headquarters or formed headquarters staff into the training serials. Uh, and again, I think Australia are at the cutting edge of this, and they've had divisional uh, elements of divisional headquarters coming in for the exercise. But actually, that gives people like the General Burleson, the Eighth, Arm, uh, Eighth Army Command, real opportunities to work with big chunks of troops, even if it's uh, a few staff officers um, uh, and a large virtual capability. So I think that that will happen over the coming um, the coming months and years. I think just thickening the staff in the headquarters and and trying to um, trying to uh, put meat on the bones of the of the great revitalization as it, as it was then called um, and actually giving real planning power within the United Nations command. I think that's really important. Um, Japan, I mean, really complex and uh, and sort of outside my lane, but but in terms of the sort of geostrategic changes that are going on with Japan and trilateral relationships between um, between the US, Japan, and Korea. But again, I think that's opportunity, uh, and I think that's something we should be looking at developing from a personal perspective. I think. Any improvements that can be made there can only be good for, for strengthening that deterrence and the, the deterrence that the United Nations Command um, provides. Thank you. Thanks. That's a very, very good point, particularly with regard to the uh, last one about this. Uh, so we have an upcoming trilateral leaders meeting uh, at Camp David um, later, this, uh, later uh, next month. And um, the, that provides a lot of opportunity to try to break new ground in terms of um, deterrence and defense and also trilateral cooperation, um, as well as getting more buy-in among the South Korean public about, is because as you mentioned, I think a number of you mentioned, South Korean understanding of UN command at a general level is 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 quite low. And so that, that would be important as well. Uh, okay, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I uh, have a strategic level uh, question. When I look at all our efforts, uh, I don't see a guy at the NSC who's working 24 hours a day to uh, combat the regime. I don't see think tanks in town coming up with the 100 steps that we could try and pursue to break the regime. I don't see the UN command uh, coming up with 50 different ways to break the regime. Over and over again, I see no action whatsoever on degrading and breaking this regime. And the current and expanding uh, famine in North Korea would seem to op offer an opportunity uh, not seen since the 1990s. So when do we unleash the covert operators? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll say as someone who did work 24 hours a day on the NSC staff um, uh, for three years, um, um, the, uh, I mean, the administration that I worked for was accused of doing that, was accused of wanting to um, uh, uh, overthrow autocratic regimes all, all around all around the world. Um, the uh, and there may be cells that work on that within any administration, but um, there are 
as we all know, a lot of risks associated with those sorts of decisions. They would require uh, the, the very highest level support in terms of a presidential finding, and um, and these are these would be very risky endeavors. Now, as you suggest, the downside of doing nothing is that their arsenal continues to grow. The human rights situation gets worse and worse in North Korea. Um, and that is clearly the, the downside of not pursuing a more aggressive covert, covert, overt uh, strategy with regard to the regime. So um, uh, think tanks, yeah, we, we could probably come up with a hundred step program for how you would take down the regime. Uh, if if somebody would fund it, we'd be happy to do it. <laughs> but um, but I certainly understand the sentiment behind your question uh, because uh, it seems as though everything that we've been doing with North Korea for the past 30 years hasn't been working. Um, and uh, the proof for the failure of the policy is what we have what we have today. So I certainly understand the sentiment behind the question. I, I would just underscore the risks, and that's part of this, that as you look at what you could do or what the options might be, the risks are also very high on the other side of this. We don't talk often about what if North Korea becomes unstable. What if something happens, whether it's a, a catastrophe that's caused by weather or whatever? Um, they are in such dire straits in terms of the humanitarian aspect, the ability to support it, their medical systems, the diseases that we know about there. Um, one of the parts of a conflict in that peninsula is going to be there's a tremendous problem with the control and the support of the population of North Korea, regardless of how it happens. And it's a huge problem. I, when, I, when I was there, having been in Iraq and Afghanistan, my, my thought was, as I learned about the North and thought about what if we go North, what are our responsibilities with respect to the people? I, I think it made Iraq look simple. I mean, this is going to be tougher than Iraq, much tougher. And so it's that kind of risk you got to work your way through when you think about what it is we might do. And then I think, too, we should be very serious about understanding that we may not be the one that starts <laughs> that, you know, that regime's fall. And then what do we do in, in, in the case of that instability? Uh, yes, Steve. Okay, so this is a question for um, General Harrison and uh, Ambassador Lippert. So um, General Harrison, you came on board under the Moon administration and now under the UN administration, there has been an embracing of the United Nations command in the 17 sending states. So I'm not asking for political opinion, but just your insights on how the Korean government and the Korean people um, think about and receive the sending states. And then to uh, Ambassador Lipper on the same topic, how can the United States uh, help the South Koreans engage the 17 sending states? Because again, I think the big takeaway from this seminar is that the 17 sending states are there to help. Uh, and previous administrations in South Korea didn't always recognize that. So please. Thank you. Um I might kick off with that with that first point. Yeah, I have the privilege to work under both the, the Moon government and the and the Yoon government. And um and um I, I would say the relationship with the UNC is certainly different, but the United Nations Command has worked under with and under many different governments over the years. And it's got to be flexible enough to move with the with the changes in administration. Uh, and I hope we've achieved that over the last year and a half under under the new government. Um, the opportunities change as the administrations change, and for me, it's about cementing the, the, those those changes and getting tangible uh, improvements that will stand the the slings and arrows of of different um, uh, political perspectives within the Republic of Korea, never forgetting their sovereignty, which of course is so important and is so precious um, to the government and absolutely understandably. So uh, I am I think we can work, the United Nations can work under, 
under any political leadership in the Republic of Korea. Um, and in some departments, it's more challenging than others. You know, for example, the incredible um, uh, Ministry of Veterans, uh, Patriots and Veterans Affairs, which are organizing a lot of the events to do with the 70th Armistice, uh, have always had an incredibly strong relationship with the UNC. Other departments, um, and much of it's personality driven, um, it, it can be more challenging, but it, it's what we do and um, we will try to try to seize opportunities and work through um, challenges. Thank you. Mark? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's a good question and I haven't given it enough thought, I have to say, um, between an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, a full-time job, the capital cable, there's just not, and dealing with a <laughs> angry basset hound, there Doosan, isn't a lot Doosan left. Dusan Bears, Bears television Bears. On, on, on Neighbor every day. Um, I guess what I would say is uh, I have, you know, I would think of it in five steps, and they're not necessarily sequential, but sort of parallel lines of operation. First, it's been alluded to, I think you got to get the relationship right with the Korean uh, the Korean government and UN command, because I think if you get into this choice between UN command and the Korean bilateral relationship in other capitals, that's a losing hand on many different levels, right? And the Koreans, you know, you just want to stay out of that. Let me just put it that way in the interest of time. Second, I think if you, once you get that buy-in or as you're getting it, you know, I think the U.S. has to send a strong signal at the very highest levels of government that this is important to the United States, right? And getting that prioritized in the bureaucracy to come up at leader level meetings within ministerials two plus two, perhaps even almost a convening uh, ministerial like what, the one that was done uh, several years ago in Canada. I think that would be important too. Just basically the higher level, and it can't be just the, the people at the NSC on the Korea desk or the ambassador in Korea. It's got to be, you know, highest levels of U.S. government. Third is then peace, regularize it. In, ter in terms of some sort of ministerial right presence, you know, have you know working level meetings at the assistant secretary level or deputy assistant secretary level regularly, right? And then commitments, right, that come out of that um, in terms of who you who will be sending what to exercises, what political messages will we be sending, how will we be convening at what level? Final two points, I think. Then you'd sort of think through what's you know it, it's an important issue. But it's a crowded international agenda, especially for some of these other sending states where the U.S. makes a lot of asks and a lot of demands. I mean, having been the, sec the chief of staff to the secretary of defense, we consistently, especially in the middle of Afghanistan and others, would go around to Europe and make a lot of requests. And so thinking through not just the priority on the U.S. side, but what's in it for the sending states, right, and how to you know, perhaps provide some sweeteners along the way, right? And there are some sweeteners out there in terms of interoperability, you know, so it's it's not an empty bucket, but creating that. And then just to get off the stage, then be thinking through who else might observe, join, otherwise be party to this, right? In terms of outside the 17, are there some other nations that might want to plug and play, observe, help strengthen, help build momentum and use those to help, uh, you know, basically create uh, favorable winds and tides at your back. And let me stop there. Can I ask, so just to follow, so how important it, is it, and all, any one of you can chime in, is important that the the convener of this, how is important, how important is it that it be the United States or it not be the United States? Well, I think the, I think it's less about the convener being the U.S. because I think there are others who could convene, but I think it's the signal that the United States sends of importance, right? Because I think the first question you're going to get diplomatically is, is the what does the U.S. think about this, right? Sure. Given their role, given their throw weight, given their so I think that's one. And then I think there's a there'll be a check with the Koreans, and then what I would call you know the uh, other core allies who are intimately involved, like the Brits, like the Aussies, like the Canadians, Canadian, yeah. right? How interested are they? And that's the core group, I think, yeah. from which you have to work. General. Yeah, I, I would agree. And the only thing I would add is that in the military perspective, there's only a few countries that from a military perspective, you could say you're the convener and they've got the experience to pull this kind of a yeah. military 
contingent together in a multinational organization. So I think that's that is an aspect you've got to look at. And not that it's not only the United States, but there's only a few. Right. right. And let me just add one last thing. Sorry, two fingers. Just there are some advantages of having the U.S. not be the convener. Right. right? right. It's, right. But I think the the point is, are is the U.S. serious is a threshold question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Tay Kim. I'm, I'm, I'm an LA correspondent of Chavi Yilbo, Free Freedom Press in, in published in Korea and also write for uh, International Mayors for Senior Times in LA. Yeah, so I, I came from LA for this event and thank you so much for uh, having this opportunity. Thank you for coming. So my question is, oh, earlier this year, President Yoon, um, you know, he came over here and then declared uh, the Washington de Declaration with President Biden. And they agreed to have formed this uh, nuclear consultative body, which is has, has already been formed. I, uh, that, that's what I, to my understanding. So what what do you think, you know, all of you think about moving forward with uh, realizing what they have agreed with the consultative body? Um, so I, I understand it's still in a very early stage and uh, it's being discussed and talked in the prim primarily in the academic circles. And a few months ago, there are two professors from Dartmouth who, um, you know, wrote an article about uh, in favor of, of, of South Korea, you know, uh, moving forward with the pro nuclear program uh, on the basis that, that their, their rhetoric, their logic was that, um, you know, UK and France, they developed their own programs during the Cold War, and uh, it, it contributed quite a lot to the uh, final, you know, eventual downfall of Soviet Union. So in, in that regard, do you, uh, all of you think, uh, you know, the program in favor, favorably, or, or what do you think? I, I, I think it's a natural right step forward for, for, for South Korea. Um, well, thanks for the question. We did have a, a bit of a conversation about the NCG uh, and extended nuclear uh, deterrence at the beginning of the at the beginning of the session. I I'll just sum up what some of the things that were said. For one, that um, it was a good sign that the nuclear consultative group and the porting of the USS Kentucky uh, happened so soon after you know, basically weeks after the Washington Declaration, which showed a clear intention and focus of purpose by the governments um, to implement the Washington Declaration, the NCG. Second, that this that this NCG happened at, at a very high level for the first meeting, uh, senior White House official, senior YPO official uh, at the, uh, essentially the deputy national security advisor level. And that also, third, they laid out some very clear work streams in terms of things that we're going to work on, in terms of security information, of, of information, exercising, uh, interoperability, a whole number of things. So um, I think, as Ambassador Lippert said, they're off to a good start. Um, uh, I think most of us believe it did answer the mail in terms of uh, uh, both dealing with uh, uh, balancing non-proliferation interests as well as nuclear deterrence interests, but it's we're not done. There's clearly more that needs to be done in that respect. And um, speaking personally, I think that, you know, the work that the two administrations have done on this, there's been a lot of work behind this, a lot of work to make these sorts of things happen. Um, and, um, you know, uh, from the perspective of Hanover, New Hampshire, Things might might not may may not may look a certain way, but I think from the perspective of Washington and Seoul, uh, they have to deal with the reality of how to contend with a growing burgeoning North Korean capability while balancing non-proliferation interests. And I think they've done a, a pretty good job of that. And I think I and I think that's generally been the view uh, in DC uh, um, all around on both sides on both sides of the aisle. So. It's fine to knock Hanover, but if you bring White River Junction into it, Vermont, then, you know, <laughs> fighting words from my right. uh, relatives in Vermont. Okay. So I'm joking okay. anyway. So. And I say that with affection because I know both of those right. authors or colleagues of mine. I know both of them very well. I don't agree with them, but I know both of them quite well. Um, well, I think uh, 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 I want to thank everybody for their uh, for their participation in this. I want to particularly thank uh, General Harrison for 
uh, I assume you're going to continue on with your day. You're not going to sleep <laughs> at this point. So take another cup of coffee. And we really appreciate uh, very much you joining us, General Scafarotti, Ambassador Lippert, and all of you. Thank you very Thank much. You. You probably, whoa, sorry. Um, you, you probably know that I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate to also be the uh, president of the Korean War Veterans Memorial Foundation. And during the uh, uh, amazing state visit in April, I had the great fortune to escort uh, both the first couples at the Korean War uh, Veterans Memorial. And uh, when we got to the part of the memorial that's called the UN curb, where it lists all 22 countries that fought in the Korean War uh, against uh, North Korea and uh, China, I made that point that we've just been making here all day, that you know, 22 countries fought uh, against uh, North Korea's invasion, 17 are still there. And so both presidents took note of that. They're like, oh, okay. And so my point on that is there is awareness <laughs> of this. And I think there's great interest. And so we need to continue the discussion uh, on that. Uh, so again, we really want to thank uh, everybody for that. Thank you for the excellent questions. Uh, well, I want to thank um, the uh, CSIS and KDVA staffs for coordinating and putting this together. In particular, Ms. Erlene Hollerith of KDVA and Ms. Uh, Minji Hyun um, for their hard work and excellence. Also want to thank the uh, Wadaf Astoria staff for their assistance. Uh, you've been first rate. Thank you very much. Um, two Two quick announcements. On Thursday at 5 p.m., the Korean War Veterans Memorial Foundation will honor Korean War veterans and their families from all 22 UN sending states who helped defend South Korea. The ceremony will be at the Korean War Veterans Memorial and remarks will include from U.S. Senator John Ossoff, uh, General John Tadali, the chairman of the foundation, uh, the Korean Minister of Defense Acquisition Program, Administration, Minister Om Dong Hwan, and the uh, South Korean President of the United States, uh, Ambassador uh, Cho Hyun Dong. So again, want to just thank everybody uh, for uh, being here with us. Again, you are literally going to walk through the reception area, so please stop by, get some hors d'oeuvres, get some drinks, meet these fantastic speakers, and again, thank you for coming, and we'll see you at a, our next event. Thank you. <laughs>